talk this morning is we're going to go back to a series that we started and then we stopped Vision Sunday. It's called The Subversive King. It's difficult for me to say I've been saying The Submissive King for a long time. And that is a very different kind of series. But The Subversive King is, um, I'm really enjoying this series. It's um, an opportunity to go back to some of the key verses in the Bible. Some of the key ones that help us explain the whole story of the Bible. Um, I liken these um, verses to moments in the film or a film, a particularly complex film, where you might zone out, check out, get distracted by a phone call or your phone. And you miss the key plot, a moment where they describe something pivotal to the whole point of the film. And then when you get to the end of the film, you're thinking, what on earth happened? And these passages are like that. We can read them through really quickly. I don't know, maybe trying to read the Bible in one year or something crazy like that, we might just race through these verses and not take the time to pause and to reflect and see what they mean. And we're in a season of Lent. And Lent is an opportunity to slow down, to pause, to reflect, to contemplate, to ponder, all of those kind of words. And in Lent we're taking an opportunity to reflect on our lives and we're taking the time to reflect on what the Bible says about our lives, where it might guide us, where it might move us. And these verses come directly from the last few weeks of Jesus' life when he's having his last attempt, a ditch attempt to pull people towards him. And I think these are some of the key verses that we can often get to the end of the Bible misunderstanding these and thinking, what on earth is this thing? all about. I haven't the foggiest of what's going on. So we're going to do just that this morning. We're going to read a bit of the Bible and we're going to have a little ponder about it and see what it means for us and the rest of our lives and for us as a community. It comes from Matthew 21 verse 28. I haven't put the divider in Bible so this is going to take me a few minutes to find the page. If you've got a Bible, whip it out. If you've got a phone, turn it on or I'm going to read it for you and it's going to come up on the screen. It's a parable. It's called the parable of the two sons. It says this. What do you think? This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, to the uh, religious elite in Israel. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first son and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he said. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son, the second son, and he said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Then he says to the people listening, which of the two did what the father wanted? The first they answered. And Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Amen. Amen. Have you ever posted something on social media that you then regret? Um, Apparently there's something called regret posting. Have you heard of this? It's fantastic not being on social media. This just flies me by. I don't know what it means. But apparently, the independent newspapers reported that six in 10, 60% of all adults, not just kids um, or silly people, 60% of all adults suffer from regret posting, where they've put something on social media, something like Facebook. Uh, Is that still around? It's still around. Something on Facebook, which they then later regret. A couple of examples of these is... Is the, is the screen working? A couple of examples of these. I want to read this. This is Matthew. He posted, My teacher is so dumb, he thought the sun was a star. Ali responded, and That's because it is. He responded, No, it's not. A sun is a sun, a star is a star. Saying that a sun is a star is the same as saying a tomato is a fruit. It gets even worse, doesn't it? <laughs> that's right. It's not true. Bless him. I've got another one. Um, unnamed this one. I think it's appropriate. Canadians think the Titanic was a real event and not just a movie. How dumb can you be? I really hope you're kidding, is the response at the bottom. Social media has the ability to take old opinions, old views, old understanding, and and make them permanent. They're fixed in time. 
They're there as a permanent reference as to who you are. They never die. They're a permanent reminder of our past that we can never quite escape. They don't allow growth and they don't allow change. But people do change. People change their minds. Changing our mind because of new information is not a negative, it's a positive. We often hear that in politics, don't we? When a politician's made a U-turn, we cry out thinking, what, a, what an idiot, why do they do that? But actually, it's a sign of maturity to change our mind because of new information. It's a sign of maturity. It shows that there's transformation. It shows that we can be transformed. To not change our mind because of new information is immaturity. It shows stagnation. It shows an inability to be transformed and change. And I think, slightly in a weak tangent, um, that it is slightly what's going on in this Bible passage, where the religious leaders who have been tied to practices, to beliefs, to translations, they've been presented with new information from both John the Baptist and from Jesus. And they're challenged by that. It's a new way of seeing things, a new interpretation from Jesus, a new understanding, and they're refusing to change their opinion. The old opinions and the practices and the views and the beliefs are permanent. They are not for change. New information is not welcome here. They're modeling stagnation, not transformation. And I think that's what Jesus is upset about in this passage. A bit of context for this passage is it's the last week of Jesus' life, we believe. He's speaking to the religious elite. He's speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking to the people that rule in that nation. It's his last attempt to reach out to the religious leaders. They're stubborn. They've rejected John, and now they're rejecting Jesus. There's a misunderstanding generally about everyone, from the disciples, even from all that hear Jesus, about what it means to follow him and who he is. Jesus is going public, and when he's public, he's more confrontational. He's less of the soft, gentle Jesus. He's more of the confrontational, in-your-face Jesus. He's highlighting that Israel has failed in its mission in the passages leading up to this one, that they have failed to be a light for the nations, to fail to be a city on a hill, a bright light where all nations can see and come and know who God is. He's come looking for justice, for righteousness, but he's found bloodshed and distress. In the previous episode of this series, we hear where Jesus kicks over the tables in the temple courts, creates a right old havoc because he believes the temple, the very place where people can come and speak with God and be with God, can't even get into the place. There's restrictions, there's barriers for God. And just before this passage, the religious leaders are, they're really challenged by Jesus. And they ask him a question, under what authority are you saying these things? In other words, who the blooming hell are you? We know what's right. But he doesn't answer the question. He challenges them back. He asks them about John, John the Baptist, who has been killed through their will. And he asks, what is he? Was he of God or was he of man? And they know that if they answer that question, they're going to be up for a riot. So they don't answer the question. So Jesus doesn't answer the question about authority. So we're in stalemate. We're in lockdown. There's no movement. And then Jesus tells a parable. He tells a story. In fact, he tells three parables. I'm only going to read one, which is the parable of the sun. The other is of the vineyard, and the other is of the banquet. And they all look at the same thing. And I think this passage is about transformation. It's about Jesus' frustration that the religious leaders are not for transforming, but they are for stagnation. He didn't come to condemn. He came to transform. Despite his frustrations with the religious rulers, as I often read these passages, I think he's condemning and cutting them out, but that's not what he's doing. He's, he's offering that last olive branch by telling these parables. 
He's reaching out to them and he's reaching out to us. He wants to see transformation in our lives. And we can see transformation in our lives in two very short and very simple ways. And the first is to, to be changeable. These passages are all about repentance. In fact, all the three parables that come after this are all about repentance. That's the theme. And I know it's a bit of a dirty word for sometimes. It's a dirty, dirty word for me, repentance and what it meant. You shall repent, was kind of how I see that word. But actually, translated, it just simply means to change your mind, to turn around, to make that huge turn on your thinking because of Jesus. In this parable, Jesus isn't looking for perfection in us. He's looking for changeable people. Neither of the two sons was perfect, actually, in this story. But one does change his mind. One changes his mind. He tells this parable to encourage us to be changeable, to be malleable, to be movable in our ways. Not set in stone, not hard, to be soft so that he can move us for our good. It's interesting comparing the disciples, a right old rabble, I've described them as before. They're open, they moan a lot, they chat a lot, but they're open, they're changeable, they're movable for Jesus. He can transform The Pharisees don't represent that. They're representing stagnation. But we have a God that wants to see our lives transformed, moved, different. An encounter with God moves us. It changes us. We're no longer the same. Our thinking is changed. Our thinking is renewed. Paul in Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, think differently because of Jesus. When Jesus tells parables. It's the reason he tells parables is because he wants us to think differently. He wants us to think for ourselves. He's not spoon-feeding us and telling us what to do. It's not a dictatorship. It's an invitation to think differently, to be different, to do different. They're meant to change our existing beliefs and replace them with new ones. And it's an ongoing process. It's not a one-off deal. It's not a one-off membership ritual that we do in the church. It's a daily activity. It's a daily activity, ongoing process. Not a one-off transaction. It's a way of life to be constantly shifted, moved, manipulated, not that way, um, molded by Jesus, not manipulated by Jesus, molded by him. We cannot live transform lives unless we are changeable, unless we can change our minds, our positions, our views, and our opinions because of Jesus. When we are closed, transformation in our lives stops. And this saddens Jesus. This is what he's upset about. It's what he's anger about, annoyed about, frustrated about. That the people of God, God's, God's holiest, aren't transformable that they are stagnant. If we are changeable, we have a faith that works. So be, change, uh, be changeable. Secondly, be honest. There's a demonstration of honesty in the first son. Dishonesty from the second son. The first son rejects. He doesn't want to do it. No thanks, Dad. He's honest. Bit of a pain, but he's honest. But he does, he changes his mind, and he does the thing. But he's honest in how he feels about the task. The second son gives the impression of openness, willingness, he will do it. But actually he doesn't, he's dishonest. He doesn't do the thing. But the honesty of the son is what leads him to change his mind. The two are linked. They're like two sides of the same coin. There's a connection the dishonesty of the second son stops him from being transformed. The subversive king that we follow, 
and we try to understand, yearns for us to be honest, to be honest with him. Honest enough to know our own brokenness, the deepest things going on in our lives, our shortcomings. We have a God who is desperate to be on the inside of what is going on in our lives. Our daughter, India, is having a wobble at school. Um, it's not like her. She's very happy at school. But in the last few weeks, she's had a wobble. She's not happy. Something's going on. And we don't know. We don't know what's going on. And we are desperate. I am desperate to know what it is. I ask her all the time. It's like trying to get blood out of a stone. I, who do you play with? What, what, what was good about school today? What was bad? Do you want to tell daddy anything? Took her for a coffee on Saturday morning just to talk to her about it. Nothing. Desperate as her father to be on the inside of what's going on. I'm desperate for that. And then breakthrough yesterday afternoon. She just speaks a little bit about what is going on. And it's like, oh, it's delight for me to know. It's hard, but it's like a delight. I've been looking to get in for weeks and I feel like I'm in and I feel like I can do something. And it's really important because India. I need India to know that she, she has me. That she has me. And that she needs me. I want her to know that she needs me. And that she has me in that situation. I'm not passive to what's going on in her life. I'm deeply active in her life. And now I know what's going on. I can kill those children. Easy. I won't do that, of course. <laughs> It's the same with Jesus. He wants us to know that we need him. He wants us to know that we need him because we have him. Because he wants to do something about what is going on in our lives. He wants to see us transformed for our good, not his. It's beautiful. Be changeable. Be honest. And to just finish off, Jesus is accusing the religious elite of being like the second son, dishonest and stubborn. He says, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitute are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. Those who are honest and have changed their minds are going ahead, is what he's saying. I've never spotted this before. He doesn't say instead of you. He says, ahead of you. It's interesting, isn't it? I've always read that as they're not welcome. The door is shut for you lot. And hopefully it's open for me. But he's not saying that. He's implying that it's still open. It's just that others are going to get there ahead of you and enjoy what is there. He's not condemning the religious leaders. He loves them. He's reaching out to them in this moment. He wants to transform them as well. He isn't warning them that they cannot be part of this. He's just showing them that there are people that are going to be going ahead of them and enjoying heaven right here and right now. The kingdom of God right here, right now. Not in its fullest capacity, but in some capacity and that's his frustration that's his yearning for his people it's happening right now and it can happen right now if we are changeable and we are honest and if we are changeable and honest we can have a faith that actually works amen amen <laughs>